The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, Exxon TV, and right across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, the Pacific Rim, Asia, India, Africa, and Europe on our growing family of broadcast affiliates. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com on MSN Messenger. Exxon Radio TV at hotmail.com and our website www.exxonradiotv.com. And Exxon Nation, before I get to my next guest this hour, the one and only Stanton T. Friedman, I would just like to remind each and every one of you that we're still doing our very best to, to bring attention to the fact that each and every year over 23,000 dolphins are slaughtered in Japan. And we're asking you, the members of the worldwide Exxon Nation, to help the slaughter. Uh, by visiting our our news site at exonnews.com forward slash thecove.htm and getting this news out to whoever you can, including your government representatives. Now, this is a global issue and must be addressed before it's, before it's too late. Please send the following link far and wide, exonnews.com forward slash thecove.htm and if you'd like to watch The Cove Movie, visit their website at www.thecovemovie.com Dot com. Nuclear physicist Stanton uh, Friedman received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in physics from the University of Chicago in 1955 and 1956. He was employed for 14 years as a nuclear physicist by such companies as GE, GM, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerojet General Nucleonics, and McDonnell Douglas, working on such highly advanced classified Projects eventually canceled programs such as nuclear aircraft, fission and fusion rockets, and various compact nuclear power plants for space and terrestrial applications. Stanton became interested in UFOs in 1958 and has lectured about them at more than 600 colleges and over 100 professional groups in all 50 states, 9 Canadian provinces, and 16 other countries, in addition to various nuclear consulting efforts. He has published more than 90 UFO papers and has appeared on hundreds of radio and television shows, including Larry King Live in 2007 and twice in, uh, is twice in 2008, I should say, and uh, many others. And joining me now from his home in beautiful Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada's picture province, is Stanton T. Friedman. And Stan, always a great pleasure and honor having you here in the X-Zone. I'm delighted to be on. I enjoy doing radio because I grew up with radio. <laughs> yeah, you know, Stan, uh, you and I were talking briefly before air and uh, before we went on air, and you've been a very busy man this year. You've been traveling to Saudi Arabia, Poland, uh, San Paulo, Brazil, and you've got Magic Man, M A J I C Man movie coming up very shortly. Where do you find time to do all this? Plus, continue your lectures, your radio appearances, your media appearances. Well, you... all that stuff was uh, lectures and, and media stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm really surprised, quite frankly, if you'd asked me two years ago, when you're slowing down, I think, well, I'll be slowing down pretty quick. There's not much going on. Nobody will want an old guy. Well, they do, too. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> I'm keeping at it. And uh, as long as I'm healthy, and I have been, I've been blessed. Both my parents live to be 90, and so... right. Anybody who doesn't like what I'm doing, I got 14 more years to do it. <laughs> well, you know, Stan, uh, I I call you the great grandfather of ufology. You were, you know, if it wasn't for you and the great work that you've done on Roswell, I think the ufology may have by may have by this time fallen to the wayside. 
Well, I, I hope I've had something to do with that. And, uh, you know, I feel strongly uh, mm -hmm. about making sure the world gets educated. I'm, I'm opposed to miseducation, false education, lies. All right, Stan, you and I have to take a break. Stand by. Stanton T. Friedman is our guest. www.stantonfriedman.com. Don't go away. Back in two. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. We all desire health, happiness, and fulfillment, but often get in our own way. Repeated patterns that leave us out of control can keep us feeling powerless, frustrated, and unable to move forward in spite of our best efforts. Unconscious patterning disconnects us from our gifts, often destroying the very thing we seek. But there is an answer. We can take charge of our destiny and heal the trauma of our history. Shamanism is an effective ancient modality that can reconnect us with our true selves, empower the creation of our dreams, and return us to health and balance. Cody Alexander is a certified shamanic practitioner and teacher with 11 years experience. Email healingpathways33 at gmail.com or visit codyalexander.net to schedule a long-distance shamanic session today. Welcome back, everyone. Stanton T. Friedman is our special guest of this hour. His website, www.stantonfriedman.com. And uh, Stan, uh, you were telling us that you've been to Saudi Arabia, Poland, San Paulo. You've got Magic Man coming out. And we're, you know, gosh, your, your book that, that you and I talked about uh, a while ago is still out there and is still going strong. Science was wrong. Now, yeah. what, what do you contribute all this ongoing interest in UFOs when there really hasn't been any major development over the last number of years? Well, the major development has been that the press has gotten excited from time to mm -hmm. time. Uh, you know, it's really crazy. The FBI finally decides, let's get people off our back. Let's put some memos on the website so we don't have to find uh, respond to uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And everybody's gone crazy. I must have gotten 50 uh, emails about, hey, how about that exciting new FBI memo that says Roswell happened, and I have to correct them. Uh, we had those memos back in 1977, and uh, the same with the, there were a couple of other memos that mm -hmm. were put out as if it were a big deal. So I know that people are interested, and... <laughs> It's kind of funny that yesterday, I guess, it was announced that the SETI program seems to be grinding to a halt. Jeez, I wonder why. 
Well, you know, it isn't science. And, you know, I feel sorry for guys who are losing or, or may lose uh, very high-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and people get mad at me. What do you mean? I thought you guys in, into ufology would love SETI. I said, no, they're not looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. They're looking for radio signals. And I hate to say this on radio, but they're assuming that mm -hmm. aliens are stuck at the same level of broadcast technology as we have today, 110 years after radio got going. And that makes no sense to me at all. You I mean, I don't use a slide rule anymore. <laughs> you know, Stan, I had Seth Shostak on the show a number of times, and, and I've always asked Seth, I said, well, what, you know, here you're looking for radio waves to listen to. I said, what happens if the ETs that are out there are not carbon-based units, and they don't have the same method of communication as we do? How would you know what if you What happens came... if they're more advanced than we are? And e exactly. Don't have the same of exactly. And there's never an answer from SETI to that question. Well, Seth and I have debated, and we, we met, we each spent, uh, we each gave three lectures mm -hmm. on the last west, uh, westward voyage of the Queen Elizabeth II a number of years ago. And uh, he attended mine, I attended his, and. I talk about five large-scale scientific studies and ask after each one how many people here have read this one. And he hadn't read any of them. Uh, we debated on Coast to Coast Radio, a program you may have heard of. Oh, of course, yeah, sure. And uh, I won the debate, uh, 57, 33, 10, who couldn't decide one way or another. But the SETI, as a physicist, it bothers me that to violate the basic rules of physics or science, you're supposed to refer to the evidence when you present a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And yet, we never hear these guys talking about evidence. They, none of them talk about the large-scale scientific studies. Uh, none of them, they'll talk about lights in the sky which I don't much care about. They don't talk about the physical trace cases. They don't talk about the largest study ever done for the Air Force, uh, Project Blue Book Special Report 14. They don't deal at all with uh, extraterrestrial travel, if you will, uh, interstellar propulsion and stuff like that. It's not something they know anything about. And they make some really weird assumptions. They assume there is no interstellar travel, there is no colonization, no migration, and no reason why anybody would come here without wanting to sit down and have tea with them. <laughs> and, well, you know, look at it. How do we spend our money on this planet? We'll spend a trillion dollars this year on things military. A mm -hmm. trillion dollars. And a lot of that goes for uh, looking out for uh, possible uh, attacks from somebody else. We don't want any more Pearl Harbors. So we got spies in the sky and radar on the ground and all kinds of techniques, uh, NSA listening over radio signals. Uh, and, and it can't, they, they say governments can't keep secrets, which having worked on classified programs for 14 years, I say is utterly ridiculous. They can, of course, keep secrets. And in my books, I cite specific examples. I mean, we're not talking small secrets here, you know. Uh, and yet, uh, just the other day, an astronomer, a prominent one, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's head of the Hayden Planetarium. He's a bright guy. He speaks well. He performs well in front of the cameras. He's, got a, he's charismatic, no mm -hmm. question about it. And yet, when he spoke to 1,800 students at Penn State University earlier this month, he was saying, you know, people making a big deal about lights in the sky, you know, forgetting the radar visual cases, the physical trace cases, and all the rest of that. And then he said, and, you know, this notion of government secret, you can evaluate that. Look how much we know about President Clinton's genitalia. They can't keep secrets. <laughs> like this, you know, what kind of rationale is that? Uh, and... and uh, it's disgusting that mm -hmm. uh, they get the airwaves. He also said, in another example of what I'm talking about, on the um, well, Peter Jennings mockumentary of February 24th, 2005, uh, Dr. Tyson talked about the Voyager spacecraft, uh, and it would take 70,000 years to get to the next nearest star. And scientists like to get their data, you know, long uh, sooner than that, if you will. He doesn't tell you that the darn thing doesn't have a propulsion system on it. It's been coasting ever since it left the Earth. 
That's like throwing a bottle in the ocean and say, well, now I'll just bottle it and I'll see how long it takes to cross the ocean. Or putting the kid's balloon in the sky. Oh, now I know how long it'll take to fly around the planet. I mean, these are absurdities. And the funny thing is, and this is where, you know, you begin to wonder, uh, every astronomer knows that the stars all over the universe, billions and billions of them, produce their energy by nuclear fusion. Now, I hope, we only figured that out in 1938, you understand, so it's not as if we're, we've been around this highly scientific world for so long. Well, uh, and I hope they also know that uh, we know how to make H-bombs. Uh, the first one exploded in 1952, uh, the power of 10 million tons of TNT. Uh, that was real progress, because during the war, uh, 1943, let's say, nine years earlier, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster. And we upped the ante to 10 million tons, and the Russians went up to 57 million tons of TNT equivalent. Well, it doesn't take long to think and look at the literature that one could use nuclear fusion to get to the stars in a reasonable time because they allow, it allows you to kick particles out the back end of a rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. Now, it's as if this information didn't exist for these guys, uh, and I find that extraordinary. They also, I have to admit, two different people, scientists, have said, Stan, look, if Roswell happened, and you're a big proponent of Roswell, surely they'd have had to pull half the professors out of the universities uh, in the country to deal with that. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Are you really unaware of the vast uh, technological institutions that were set up during the war? They had plenty of places to go for people with high-level security clearances and high competence and great equipment where money was no object. Uh, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, mm -hmm. uh, Sandia Corporation, Oak Ridge, uh, Hanford Works, a whole bunch of companies like Lockheed that put out the uh, stealth aircraft. They only spent $10 billion in secret. I mean, universities aren't the only place where research gets done. As a matter of fact, when it comes to technological research, I'm saying they're the least valuable part of the group of places where you could go to get stuff done. Uh, and, you know, it bothers me that they're so unaware of the real world out there. Um, I shocked somebody the other day by saying, you know, when I was working on at General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department, way back in 1958, we spent $100 million that year. We employed 3,500 people full-time, 1,100 of them engineers and scientists. This wasn't six professors and 20 grad students. Uh, and we didn't publish or perish. We wrote classified reports. Uh, you know, that was good enough for us. We weren't dependent on publishing or perishing. Uh, so uh, it, what what is really strange, and uh, Seth and I may have... Uh, an encounter coming up in New Mexico about Roswell, and uh, I, you know, I like him. He's a nice guy. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. guy. Yeah. yeah, and so I, I don't have any problems in that direction. But his failure to look, the whole astronomical community's failure to look at the real world in which we live is, is rather disturbing. And we have an entirely different vision of what's going on out there. There. I think the neighborhood is loaded with civilization. Mm -hmm. There are over a thousand stars within 55 light years of here. That's just down the street. And some of them are a billion years older than the sun. And what, what we're really going through is, is a real paradigm shift. First, we had Ptolemy, who said the Earth is the center of the universe. Man is on top of the heap. That's the way it is, folks. Then old Copernicus came along, 1543, the book was published. He died that same year. So he didn't get burned at the stake, which happened to Bruno in the year 1600. Uh, he had the gall to suggest, hey, uh, folks, the Earth is not the center of the universe. The sun is. And all the planets and stuff go around the sun. Well, the church banned the book for 300 years. You see, he still left man on top of the heap. 
Now we're faced with a little dilemma. You know what? The sun isn't the middle of the galaxy. It's not the middle of the universe. Man is clearly not at the top of the heap unless you buy into the notion that the world was created in uh, 4004 B.C., according to Bishop mm-hmm. Usher. I think it was October 23rd. Stand, sure. stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation. Nation, a special guest tonight, the grandfather, the great-grandfather of ufology. Stanton T. Friedman, www.stantonfriedman.com. We'll be back after the news. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together, we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Exonation Stanton T. Friedman is our special guest this hour. His website is www.stantonfriedman.com. And uh, we're going to be talking about Stanton's book, Science Was Wrong. And uh, Stanton, how is science wrong about UFOs? I thought what we knew about UFOs was from a scientific perspective. Well, there's only one chapter. There are 14 chapters, and my co-author Kathleen Marden and I, we mm-hmm. also did capture the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience. She's Betty's niece, has all the tapes and the inside scoop and all that sort of thing. Uh, this book sort of fell out of uh, that, plus my book, Flying Saucers and Science. We realized that everywhere you turned, you found obstacles created by the stubborn, noisy negativists, if you will, saying something was impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you might laugh at some of the things, but uh, it's hard to raise money when the big shots say it can't be done. Let me give you a quote that summarizes the attitude. This is from Dr. Simon Newcomb. He was the top American astronomer of the 19th century. He was so important when he died in around 1910 that the president attended his funeral. Anyway, he wrote this statement. The demonstration that no possible combination of known substances, known forms of machinery, and known forms of force can be unified in a practical machine by which man shall fly long distances through the air, seems to this writer as complete as it is possible for the demonstration of any physical fact to be." Now, the interesting thing is he said that two months before the Wright brothers' first flight. 
and he knew nothing about flight, really. The Wright brothers, two bicycle mechanics, mm -hmm. they collected all the information they could find, and they found that they weren't able to calculate things using old relationships. They built their own little wind tunnels. They were experimentalists. They tried. They, you know, put change this, change that, see what's going on. But when you have a prominent person saying that, it makes it hard to get funding. And it's, <laughs> I still have to laugh. They won a bonus of $5,000 when they sold a plane to the United States government within a few years at that time because they were able to go faster than 40 miles an hour. Can you imagine? Uh, and that is just typical of smart people saying stupid things. And, you know, surprisingly, uh, Thomas Edison, uh, there's no doubt that he was a creative genius. He had over a 1,000 patents. Here's what he said in 1895. It is apparent to me that the possibilities of the airplane, which two or three years ago was thought to hold the solution to the flying machine problem, have been exhausted, that we must turn elsewhere. Uh, he was off just a bit. And so uh, many of the chapters deal with things that had real, uh, re real significance to mm -hmm. people. That is, people died because people listened to the big shots, making false claims without evidence, research by proclamation. So there's only one chapter that deals with UFOs, but we get into that question. Oh, well, there's a second one. Kathleen did one on the UFO abduction uh, situation and all the dumb things that have been said by smart people and the attacks on the Betty and Barney Hill case and other abductions. And you see, we need to recognize that there may be people today saying things are impossible that aren't true either. And, uh, you know, space travel is utter bilge, said the British royal astronomer in 1956, one year before Sputnik. And he said, "What? nobody is going to fund that kind, nobody's going to spend that kind of money. Besides, it would be much more valuable to buy better equipment for astronomers. And who's benefited most from the space program? The astronomy community. Unfortunately, the new data shows that they were wrong, 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 wrong all over the place. You know, Mars was not always dry. That's Venus right. It was yeah. not a tropical paradise, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we don't move forward unless you've got people, big mouths like me, uh, clearing the way to say, yes, this is worth doing. Uh, and the medical thing, uh, let me give you just one example um, there was a doctor who said that the possibility that hemophiliacs could get HIV from transfusions was one in a million. Keep doing what you've been doing, what hemophiliacs were doing. We're using pooled products, that is, products made from by 5,000 donations of blood, and you chemically treat it, and you get a concentrate of the missing clotting factor. And it was a life-saving substance. But there were people saying, hey, uh, we've been finding this HIV, and it's probably transmitted through uh, transfusions. Oh, no, one chance in a million. Keep doing what you're doing. Bottom line, 10,000 American and about 1,000 Canadian hemophiliacs were made HIV positive by this life-saving drug. And the funny thing is, the Germans had proved several years earlier that heat treatment would destroy viruses. They were looking at hepatitis, but mm -hmm. it turns out it works very well for HIV. But the American company said, hey, that costs money. We don't want to do that. So 10,000 in the states alone got HIV positive because of people following the trail of somebody who didn't know what he was talking about. And so there are consequences. Uh, the people who didn't get vaccinated because there were people who said, hey, smallpox is God's way of uh, controlling the population. And there were all kinds of attempts to poo-poo the mm -hmm. idea of vaccination. So it, it's, it's a sad story, but it seems to be always, in other words, uh, hundreds of years ago and 50 years ago and today, too, as well. And that, that's kind of, it, it's kind of a shame, really. It, it's also, along with that, the belief that the experts must be right, is the people who say that governments can't keep secrets. 
and that really bugs me and uh, because they aren't keeping secrets and they have always kept secrets and uh, people who don't think they can are being terribly naive uh, just one example uh, during World War two the Brits had broken the German uh, communications code uh, and boy, that was a big step because it's sure nice to know what the other guy is uh, saying and doing, you know, when he thinks you don't know what he's saying or doing. And there were 12,000 people in Bletchley Park in England, 12,000 of them, whose job it was to intercept German military communications. That was easy. They were broadcasting pretty much out in the open. Mm -hmm. And then decode them and then translate them and then distribute them very carefully to only those who needed it. Because if the Germans found out the code had been broken, uh, they'd have changed it and we'd have been tough out of luck. Well, you'd think at the end of the war, of course, it would have been heralded as part of the great victory came from the smart guys over there. 25 years before anything was said in public. Because as it happened, the Allies were reading other countries' mail. People were using the same codes, <laughs> code uh, techniques, you know. So, but that's quite a secret when you can get 12,000 people to keep it for 25 years when clearly techniques had changed and so forth. So uh, people ought to be a little bit wary of thinking that they know everything the government's doing. You know, black budgets don't exist, uh, no problem, just listen to what they tell you, and they're telling the truth. And this has come up, of course, in, with regard to UFOs and the uh, Operation Majestic 12 documents. And uh, I'm really look fo looking forward with a certain amount of trepidation, but uh, hopefully anticipation <laughs> instead, to this movie that I mentioned to you, uh, Top uh, Magic Men, M-A-J-I-C. Now, that word magic comes from the security designation of a number of documents called the Majestic 12 or Magic 12 or MJ-12 documents. Very hotly contested. Oh, they're obvious frauds, say some people. Well, I've been to 20 archives, and my book, Top Secret Magic, shows that it isn't obvious at all that they're fraud. Most of them are. You'd expect the government to put junk out there. Oh, well, of course, to, to put you on a different track. Yeah, there are three really good ones. And uh, Magic Men is the title of the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, screenplay is being written uh, as we speak by Bryce Zabel. He's the guy who did Dark Skies. Remember that television show, Dark Skies? Yeah. Uh, and he even wrote a nice uh, comment about my book, Top Secret Magic. Anyway, what he did, what he and associates, uh, Donnie Most is one of his associates uh, from Happy Days. Mm hmm. He was also involved in movie production. <laughs> uh, and what they're, what this will be is a result of their having optioned my life, my life story anyway, <laughs> and that of Don Schmidt, who's been researching Roswell since way back in the late 80s. And uh, they optioned his book, Witness to Roswell, and my book, Top Secret Magic, and it'll be the, the difficulties and triumphs uh, of researchers trying to find out the truth about Roswell and MJ-12. And, you know, we each went through more than one partner. And uh, it'll be a combination, he says, hopefully, of all the president's men, you know, Woodward and Bernstein kind of thing, and JFK. And uh, well, Richard Reif is going to play me. That's my thought. <laughs> From Close Encounters to Stanton Friedman, what else can I say? Listen, Stan, well, doesn't that make sense? I, I think it does. Stan, there's, there's, there was something I wanted to ask you about uh, from your book, Science Was Wrong. Uh, you know, Stephen Hawking is one of the best-known scientists on the planet. Now, yes. in your opinion, were his comments about aliens another example of astronomers being wrong? Yes, very definitely. As a matter of fact, I, I do a monthly column for the MUFON Journal, Mutual mm -hmm. UFO Network Journal. And I commented strongly about that because I thought he really went off base. You know, he was saying, uh, we shouldn't let them know we're here because uh, look what Columbus, what, you know, the Columbus and yeah. the natives didn't do the natives any good. He also said at the same time, roughly, that uh, besides if anybody was coming here, they'd have sent a signal first. You know, Columbus sent smoke signals to the natives. Of course he did. <laughs> you know. Hey, we're bringing 20 guys, have dinner ready. 
I mean, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And uh, the notion, uh, Columbus didn't have weapons of mass destruction. You might have noticed that, uh, as we do. Uh, the aliens have reason to fear the stupidity of man. Uh, you know, we've demonstrated that capability um, uh, quite a lot, let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Every day. Uh, and so uh, I think he doesn't seem to understand that we represent a threat to the neighborhood, but also that there is overwhelming al evidence that aliens have been visiting already, and they haven't obliterated us. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's the old story of the turkeys mm -hmm. talking to each other uh, a week before Thanksgiving. Aren't we lucky? We get all this food, and it's cold outside, and all the water we need, and we're kept warm. What great masters we have. And then comes Thanksgiving. Oh, sorry, folks. <laughs> Too early <laughs> conclusion, but... No, I think Stephen was wrong. Uh, I don't think he's looked at any of the evidence. I, I've never found examples of any of the astronomers who look at the evidence. Uh, J. Allen Hynek, maybe, but he wouldn't look at the evidence of uh, interstellar travel. I tried to get him to. No luck. Now, you were also, uh, I, I believe, classmates with the late Carl Sagan. and. Yes, um, but you've noted in Science Was Wrong and elsewhere that he was wrong about UFOs, abductions, government cover-ups. Why? Why was he wrong? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Why do I say he was wrong? Well, a typical example is Carl uh, said more than once that there are interesting sightings that aren't reliable. There are reliable sightings that aren't interesting. Mm -hmm. But there are no interesting and reliable sightings. And yet the facts from the biggest study ever don't done show exactly the opposite. And they were presented at a conference, well, at the congressional hearings in my paper. He was one of the presenters there. He's got the paper. Uh, it sounds great, except it wasn't true. He also wrote an article in uh, a weekly supplement uh, about the Betty and Barney Hill case, where he got everything wrong, uh, just as he did in the Cosmos series. Remember, he did nine minutes about mm -hmm. the Hill case. Yeah, you know everything from saying it was just a light in the sky uh, to having the windshield wipers running. Uh, you know, it was a beautiful, clear night. What do you want? <laughs> Maybe it was uh, bug splatter. Uh, that's what it is. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. But uh, Carl, you know, now I met with Carl a year before he died at his home in uh, Ithaca, New York. We had coffee and cakes. Uh, I was given a lecture there, and the advisor to the Cornell UFO group was a professor in Carl's department, and he knew about our uh, being together in college, and uh, so he brought me to Carl's house because he couldn't go to the lecture that right. night, and something was going on, and we, we talked, and it was a friendly discussion. Stan, I'm going to have to hold you here on this one. We'll uh, continue this when we come back on the other side of this commercial break. Always a great pleasure having you with us, Stan. Exonation, uh, Stanton T. Friedman's our guest. We're talking about, amongst other things, uh, Stan's book, Science Was Wrong. His website is www.stantonfriedman.com. And I'll be back with Stan on the other side of this uh, commercial break as we continue from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Talk Star Radio Network. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. 
Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Stanton T. Friedman is our guest, www.stantonfriedman.com. Uh, Stan, before we went to the break, we were talking about you were having coffee with uh, Carl Sagan at his place in New York City, uh, in the state New of New York. New, New York, York state. state, yeah, and I was wondering if we could just finish that before we have to say so long yeah. for tonight. Uh, I should say that we did re- we discussed the fact that mm-hmm. he had had a security clearance and stuff, and so people have suggested that you know, maybe he took Donald Menzel's place on the MJ-12 group. And Carl was never in the military, neither was I for that matter. But uh, And he used to protest government operations. So I'm a little dubious about that, but maybe so. But, you know, the Brookings Institute, way back in the early 60s, did a study on what would happen if there was contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And one of the many conclusions was that the people who would be hurt the most by that was the scientific community. <laughs> Because it would take away their special status, you know, at the top of the heap. So is is it possible? Is it part of that? Is it possible then that the cover-up has nothing to do with the government, but everything to do with the scientific community? Well, uh, I think the government does have a lot to do with it on the intelligence side. The National Security Agency, you know, I show a whole bunch of whited-out documents. Mm -hmm. The CIA with blacked-out documents. General Carol Bolander said that reports of UFOs, which could affect national security, are made in accordance with JNAP 146 and Air Force Manual 55-11 and are not part of the Blue Book system. Hmm. He said that in 69. That resulted in the closing of Project Blue Book. I talked to him about 10 years later. He meant exactly what it sounded like he meant. There were two separate channels, the hot stuff and the cold stuff, if you will. Uh, it's no, there's no question that there's been a cover-up uh, by the government. Now, whether they care or don't care about the effect on scientists, I don't know. But certainly governments have to worry about staying in power. Remember, uh, there is nobody who speaks for planet Earth. You may have noticed that. Uh, and there's no government that wants its citizens to think of themselves as Earthlings. Nationalism is the only game on this planet of ours which is rather unfortunate because to the aliens, I'm sure, we're all Earthlings, like it or not. And so there are some major geopolitical things. Uh, There is a book, uh, After Disclosure, A.D., uh, which goes into some of these questions by Bryce Sable and Richard Dolan. And uh, I don't think they've adequately looked at the technological military consequences, if you will. Are we and the Russians both going to put everything we have out on the table? I don't think so. I haven't seen any signs of that kind of uh, cooperation. Have you? No, I haven't, Stan. But speaking about signs, I'm getting the sign from my producer on the other side of the glass that you and I have to say so long for now. Stan, as always, a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you for being there for each and every one of us and for getting out as much information as you do and continued success. And I look forward to the next time you and I meet here in the X-Zone. Well, I look forward to it, too. Take care, Stan. Exo Nation, Stanton T. Friedman has been my guest this hour. www.stantonfriedman.com I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the hour as we continue from our studios here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 
the home of the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't go away. We'll be back after the news.